I'd like to thank uh, most of you for sticking through this and getting to the end. It's a, a real achievement. We've had some fantastic presentations today. I'm hoping I'm not going to disappoint you by being last. I'd like to thank Apostolos for asking me to come here and um, speak to you this evening. So which, uh, which button? Forward? That way. It's left. Okay. All right. Um, a little bit just about me at the moment. I'm an independent marine consultant. I'm a master mariner and solicitor, so I guess that's not a great combination. Um, I've been the head of operations for two very large uh, tanker, uh, tanker fleets, and uh, unfortunately I've had incidents where we've lost ships on both the east and west coast of Africa, so I know a little bit about uh, these things. I now consult to a maritime um, security project. It's not a PCASP, it is, uh, but we do use them. And um, I'm hoping to cover a few things uh, with you, but there is a small advert, it's up at the top right, but I'm hoping that the things that you hear will make sense to you anyway, and I think some of the things chime with the uh, language used by the other speakers. All right, I'm gonna start off with a few facts. At least I think they're facts, you can tell me later if you don't agree. Um, armed security teams have made a major contribution to the security of shipping. I think that is a fact. If anybody wants to disagree, they can stick a hand up now. I'll get you later. Um, but there is this, this is another fact. Putting, merchant, putting weapons on merchant ships is a major change the way we operate. And it has significant risks attached to it. And I think as Panos says, there's a chance or a risk that we lose our sense of mission. And just for me to kind of emphasize what I think our mission is, our mission is to transport stuff from A to B safely and with as little drama as possible. So that does not mean that you can put a PCASP on board your ship and sail down a, a recognized shipping lane and just say, bring it on. That is a mistake. That is not our mission. The war of attrition against piracy is somebody else's mission. Um, and I think this is another one which is a fact. The costs to the industry associated with security are just going up and up. So those are a few facts to start the conversation off. So I've got some questions too. Have we put too much reliance on armed security? Is there now a straight line between what we, th what we think of maritime security and the solution is immediately somebody with a gun on a ship? Are there nothing, is there nothing in between that? Is that the solution? Um, I think it is a little bit premature to, I mean, I would love to see armed security, as a tanker, as a former tanker operator, I'd love to see armed security unemployed as well. Guns and gasoline, not a great combination on any day of the week. Um, but I think the, the private security industry has probably carved itself a place probably smaller than they would like, but a place in the maritime security framework as we go forward. Have we put adequate risk controls in place to ensure the safety of ship, crew, and corporation, the company? And we've talked about reputational risk. We had some really good stuff on the last session. The safety of the crew, which we've been, talk we've been talking about as well. And when we talk about risk controls, I'm talking about security infrastructure our industry's security in infrastructure. The infrastructure of our flag states, the ones we choose to register our ships with, and um, the, the infrastructure of owners. Because I think you could argue that what we've seen over Somali piracy, and I'll use that as an example rather than, I don't want to talk about Somali piracy, but I'd like to use it as a, something of a lessons learned exercise. What we've seen over recent years is a complete failure of private commercial shipping maritime security infrastructure. We didn't have it. We failed to maritime, we failed to manage space, the maritime space. We failed to cooperate in a way where we promoted the safety of ships and seafarers. And I think we failed to liaise with the guys with the aircraft carriers and the big gray ships that we really, really wanted. I'm a great fan of the SOS campaign in that it's trying to raise, it is the first time in 32 years that I've been in shipping that I've seen the industry speak with a concerted voice and have any impact at all. Although I'd have to say that I think some 30 odd thousand signatures in a global campaign, I'd agree with Cuba, that's just not good enough. We've got to do better than that in terms of getting the public to engage with us. But, so the SOS campaign, great, I'm a great fan, but I think he did say it was March 2011, 
The industry got itself organized in March 2011. And the humanitarian aspects that we've also heard about, you know, a real crisis, and they only just got started too. How did we allow that to happen? And again, there's a question around the money. We're in business. Are we spending money in the right places? So just, um, and this goes to the, 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 the commentary from Aegis. I love this slide. It is a couple of years old, but it just illustrates that bit. The pirates do not have to be that clever if we're going to be that stupid. Could, could I just point out that that was, that right angle, yes. was the excluded area up until, uh, up until March of last year. So if you're a pirate, knowing that that's going to, where you, I mean, how clever do you have to be? So this, is that, this, this, this slide, I think, illustrates that failure to manage maritime space, space brilliant. This is 2.6 million square miles of ocean that we had to use at our disposal, the kind of deviations that you were talking about, small deviations, of course, displacement of course lines, displacement of trade lanes, some very intelligent stuff that on a risk and probability basis would have ensured the safety of seafarers. The other, some language was used earlier that I really, I really take exception to, and I see, you see it a lot in, in, in this security and piracy context. And the language that is used is pirate infested waters, infested. Now, if you were infested with something like fleas or mosquitoes or lice, what would that feel like? And would that, what we see in the Indian Ocean, is that an infestation? At one point, I think there were eight to 10 piracy action groups out there in 2.6 million square miles. And I'm not trying to talk down the threat of piracy or the impact on seafarers, not at all. But it's about perspective and getting risk properly measured. And I think uh, with the gentleman earlier, Nick uh, Milner, if he's still here, you, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So this is about risk management. It's not about hyperbole and we, we, we sort of responded to the hype and the emotion of it rather than the actual technical risk and we fail to manage that risk. So amongst the risk controls, this is another risk control that I've seen. It's, uh, it belongs to a major oil company, but I don't want to single out that company. I want to use this as an example of another a sort of failure of risk control. Um, that is a policy and that policy applies all the time. Now, as far as I'm aware, piracy, could, at, at, at the very best, is described as a dynamic risk. So how can you have a fixed policy response to a dynamic risk? This, this slide will also feature in the cost element a little bit later, but you've got this enormous excluded area, which over the last couple of months, as, uh, as we were told, in the southwest monsoon, you probably could have sailed through pretty safely without any risk of boarding. But that area is excluded under this policy, and in fact, that routing actually puts you into places potentially of calmer water, calmer water where boarding is possible. So as I said, if we're going to be this dumb, the pirates don't have to be that clever. More risk controls. Um, this is around hardening, I guess. I like, I'm again, BMP4, and I've got to agree with Cuba. If you, want to go, if you want your child to go to sea, hand them a copy of BMP4 and see how they feel about a career at sea. Loads of razor wire and spiky things sticking out all over the place. I don't think your, your kids will be too keen. Um, but also, BMP4 is not maritime security. It is a sticking plaster of maritime. I think the industry did well to produce it, and they, you know, they're in their fourth iteration. But anyway, this is a hardening problem, uh, potentially. This was an RPG round into the starboard side of the wheelhouse of one of the ships that uh, was uh, operated in one of our fleets. Luckily, nobody got killed, and the ship escaped the pirates. Two days later, another tanker sailed right into the same pirate action group. Didn't move. It was published. The incident was out there amongst all the information, that loads of information that people get. Another ship in the fleet had this. This is just chain link fence that you can buy from your garden center. I'm told by people who are cleverer than I am in terms of these things that that would have potentially stopped that RPG from penetrating the wheelhouse. But you see, there's a gentleman shaking his head there, but... It yeah, well, at least he wouldn't have ended up in the side of the wheelhouse. But that's, well, that's good. That's cool. I can accept that. But, um, but uh, you know... When we start talking to you guys about what you're capable of and the guy that can put the shot in the engine block at 500 meters or something, and, and you know, I just, so I'm just not even going to go down that route, okay? B 
because I'm expecting you to turn something into gold. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, there you go. So, but so there, there is, there is still a job to do in ship preparation and hardening and, and just getting better at it. And even in, you know, BMP is a great effort, but we need to do more. We get some real wonderful solutions in shiny Kevlar and whatever, which you can't buy anywhere. But you know, I think these practical seamen-like. Um, uh, solutions are what we should be looking for because we get access to materials uh, around the area which we won't be able, able to get any, anywhere else. But anyway, um, the PMSC market, this is one of the other risk control failures. The PMSC market remains unregulated, as Panos says. That doesn't mean there aren't regulations that apply, but it itself remains unregulated. Uh, that's a huge problem for, for all of us, and, and as Panos said, that means that some ship owners now are doing their own due diligence. You've got a proliferation of vetting, um, which takes me back to my sort of days at sea when I was an OCIMF inspector. One of the complaints was, uh, at the time from the tanker community, was every oil company had its own inspection regime. And eventually we harmonized it and we got it together. But this is exactly the same thing is now happening to, to uh, PMSC. And it's a pain, as he said in a certain part of his anatomy, which I won't repeat. Um, most PMSCs are small companies. And the only reason I say that is that as owners of multi-million dollar fleets, you need proper corporate partners in, because of the risk and reputation uh, areas that we discussed uh, earlier. Most of them are going to want to sell you security teams. I mean, hey, that's the business, right? So you won't often phone up a PMSC, I think, and it says, actually, you don't need me this week. I, it's, it's good. You know, we'll, just, we'll just sail. That's not going to happen very often. And well, certainly I never heard it. Um, and they don't really, they're not really focused on, a, on this layered um, solution, real maritime infrastructure. Uh, this is something I just found extremely irritating, as, as just, and it's just administrative static is that they couldn't mobilize unless you put some money in their pockets first. They couldn't afford a plane fare, you know. Uh, so, so that happens very, very often. Not invariably, and so I'm not going to say, I'm glad. Yeah, I'd like to just cut in there, David, that I think thanks to, I lost $50,000 over a shipping company that went bankrupt in Uh, that's 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 a different issue for me. I mean, I was I was in, I was the head of a two billion dollar operation. I didn't have I didn't I wasn't worried. Okay, I can I can I can say that most of the PMSCs that I've encountered have had that problem. Okay, okay, I will sir. I'll get your card afterwards. All right. Um, and in terms of that that reputation and risk management, a lot of PMSC would fail to make that newspaper test in terms of their presence in the market and their and their their. Uh, their position as a global or a, a suitable corporate partner. Costs, again, um, this was one where, uh, this is how I got into this, interested in security in the first place, actually, because I was the head of commercial operations, not, the, not technical operations. Uh, we had a ship come out of the east coast of Africa, take that route, south of Madagascar, across the bottom and up the uh, west coast of India. And that is a $300,000 decision on a, on a large tanker. And if that's the right risk-based decision, I don't have a problem with that. But if that's just because you say that's just the way we go, um, then I do have a problem with that. It needs to be risk-based routing and the use of, yeah, so the use of space. This is a good uh, example of, of risk-based routing, and uh, we've uh, we've had some discussions from Aegis there about independent routing. Um, the route on the right of your screen is uh, a route that was proposed by the owner. The route on the left was the risk-based routing provided by our, our provider. Then there's no difference in safety terms between the two. We, we're not interested in routing ships into danger. The whole policy of this uh, the project is to keep the ships out of harm's way. So even though you're technically closer to the coast of Somalia, the, there is no, in, on our assessment, there was no difference between the, the, in, in the safety of those two routes. However, there is a difference of two days of fuel and time. So here's some cost observations. No ships capable of more than 18 knots has been taken. Oceans Beyond Piracy estimates that we as an industry spent an extra $2.7 billion on fuel, maintaining high speeds and sailing south of Madagascar and doing all that good stuff. 
2.7 billion dollars. No ship on risk-based routing has been taken. No ship with armed security has been uh, embarked has been taken. So, and I asked the question, I'm not looking for an answer from, from, from you, can we slow down, stay safe, and save some money? Everybody knows the freight markets are dreadful, but actually wasting money on any day of the week is a bad idea. If you're burning fuel that you don't need to, the environmental concerns, the rest of it. So my shopping list, sitting there in my head of operations chair, was I wanted an absolute focus on operational planning, risk to possess voyages, and a an independent routing. I wanted to use the water available in the cleverest way possible. I wanted to make sure that we the ships were assisted, trained, and uh, that their hardening, their vulnerability was properly assessed, because we had, as I illustrated, we had different standards within the same fleet operation. Um, that whole coordination of the logistics, uh, and Panos talked about the cost of the logistics of, of armed security teams, and again, if you're in a mixed fleet operation with mixed providers, the failure to provide a standard framework for the approval of those providers means you can't actually use the providers in a logistically efficient way. You end up quite often flying providers out from one place and in from another to, to service the same, same location. So you have a huge sort of cost inefficiency there. Um, as, a, as one of the world's, as a major charterer, we found that the variation in K&R rates and stuff that were being passed back to us was just enormous, and we wanted to get all that wrapped up in a, in a, in a, in a, a way where we, again, achieved a commercial efficiency. And finally, my speciality was taking hydrocarbons from A to B, I'm not a security specialist, so for me, this was a part of the, um, something that we really, really needed to outsource completely um, to somebody that was a credible partner. And um, because it just wasn't our specialization, it's not what we did. Um, when they talk about 24-hour operations, I think that to me is what 24-hour operations looks like. I had, again, small at some PMSC where the guy's got a BlackBerry by his bed and that's 24-7. Um, so I think you, know, you, you need to look at your provider and see what that 24-7 capability actually looks like. There are others that you know, operate operations rooms, but that's the kind of, the kind of thing. Um, in terms of uh, a customer, in terms of a corporate partner, and I'm not suggesting you use this one, but I'm just saying, saying what we need is somebody that's taking some of the risks that you're taking in hiring, uh, putting armed guards on your ships. Um, this is the company that, it's actually a US company that backs this project. We actually use at the moment primarily UK teams, um, but their customer base is something where you can turn around and say, yeah, it's a good chance that this company actually knows what it's talking about. And also, it doesn't want to take any risks that you wouldn't want to take yourself, because its client base would not be too happy. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>